Hey guys, thank you for coming. My name's Jack Porter. I am the Unreal Engine 4 mobile team lead from Epic Games. And uh, today I'm going to talk about our experience bringing Fortnite Battle Royale to mobile devices, uh, Android, and particularly the Galaxy Note 9. And uh, my half of the session, I'm going to talk a little bit about our process for this development and how we did the optimization. Um, and then uh, some of the, uh, a small case study of some of the uh, different areas that we found challenging. And then the second half of the session, Sung Min Lee will talk about the Vulcan specific uh, optimizations that we made. Um, so uh, first of all, I'll be talking about um, what makes Fortnite Battle Royale on mobile devices different from maybe other mobile games. Um, the Unreal Engine 4 scalability systems that we use to facilitate uh, bringing it to mobile. Um, how we optimized the process throughout development, um, and then uh, CPU, memory, um, and the improvements that have been made to Unreal Engine 4 that all developers can take advantage of, thanks to the Fortnite uh, collaboration with Samsung. Okay. So the important thing about Fortnite Battle Royale on mobile devices is that it's not a normal mo mobile port. So normally when you make a mobile game or you port an existing game to mobile, um, you have a, some hardware target in mind, a memory target, and then you modify your content until it fits, reduce your draw calls, combine objects until, um, until you have the performance that you want on your target devices. And for a mobile game, um, often the port has maybe a reduced play environment or a smaller number of players. But Fortnite Battle Royale is a cross-play game, and this means um, because we can have mobile players playing with uh, console players and PC players, we need to use the same assets uh, across all platforms. The map has to be the same, have to have the same number of players, and anything that can affect gameplay must be supported uh, with a similar fidelity. Uh, also, the engagement distance uh, has to be the same, so we can't just draw fewer things. We have to uh, make sure at least everything that can affect gameplay is drawn with at least the same draw distance on all platforms. And Android is a unique, um, it's more like a, a PC platform than a console platform um, because there's a large variation in the different uh, target devices we have to support, different performance characteristics, different amounts of RAM. Uh, there are multiple SOCs, different GPUs, different GPU drivers. Um, and also Android is very customizable. Uh, so for both uh, the user in terms of what they have done to their device and what's running in the background. Um, and uh, also the different manufacturers uh, can customize uh, the OS quite a lot. Um, so as I said, it's much more like developing for a PC in terms of the scalability required than a console platform. So for Fortnite Battle Royale, we currently target the relatively high end of the mobile market. Um, we targeted 64-bit only, um, currently Minimum is ES 3.1 or Vulkan. Uh, we chose ASTC textures, um, and currently we require around three gigs of RAM. Some of these things are not hard requirements. We could definitely support other texture formats if required, but at the moment, this is quite a good, um, th this, uh, devices with this spec provide quite a good play experience. Um, our partnership with Samsung has been key to the success here, uh, especially engineering assistance from game dev for Vulkan development uh, and optimization as well as performance analysis. Um, and they were also a great partner for launching uh, on, the, on, the game on the game launcher. So in order to uh, get Fortnite Battle Royale playable on mobile devices, we have to approach this problem as a scalability problem. So we need as many knobs as possible that we can adjust to hit our target frame rate and memory budget across the variety of devices we want to support. So we've heavily leveraged Unreal Engine's scalability features. And um, the, one of the biggest, the first area of scalability we need to look at is the renderer. And for PC and console, these are the set of features that we use. Uh, so we have... Um, you know, dynamic lights, dynamic time of day, so we need a movable directional light with some kind of shadowing system. Uh, we need some kind of skylight uh, for ambient um, effects, and we need, um, or on PC and console, we make use of ambient occlusion to improve the quality of that. Uh, we've got some local lighting for explosions and, and um, 
points of interest. Uh, we have this physical based material system um, with some various effects for skin and for foliage. Uh, we've got you know, fogs particle, fog particles, um, light shafts, those kind of things for general effects as well as post-processing. So if you want to scale this down to mobile, um, the first thing we can do is change out the uh, PC and console renderer out to the mobile renderer where we support only a subset of these features, but we support enough to make um, a, a, a reasonable play experience um, with reasonable quality fidelity. Uh, reasonable fidelity quite uh, comparable to the PC experience. Um, so as you can see, we're still using a mobile, uh, a movable dynamic light. We're using cascaded shadow maps, but we've lost the ray trace distance field shadows. Um, we still have the movable skylight for the time of day, but we don't have the ambient occlusion. We've got local point lights. We have an approximation for the physical uh, uh, material system, the physically based material system. Um, and so we, with some trade-offs, we, um, uh, we can still provide a, a pretty good uh, quality experience. So Unreal Engine has these things called scalability groups that are intended for any settings that can change at runtime. And um, we, uh, it's just a way of grouping different uh, related settings together into a single number for each quality. So uh, we have a number that represents the resolution quality, a number that represents the uh, view distance as well as the LOD transitions for, our, uh, for the geometry, uh, the texture quality, um, shadows and foliage effects and anti-aliasing all have this single, each have this single number. And these can be overridden per platform. Um, and they are tied to a set of console variables. So uh, for example, the foliage quality um, uh, is a single number that affects some engine parameters for, for the foliage, such as the density on the grass. Um, but we can also change game-specific settings, such as, um, for example, uh, in the distance, your player has a weapon, whether that weapon is animated or not um, could be uh, is affected by the, uh, the scalability group. Um, and so on the right-hand side, we're defining what the uh, settings that are applied for foliage quality 0, 1, 2, or 3 are. And uh, on the right-hand side, that's just the Android settings. So uh, compared to console, we have up to 75% of the density of the grass going down all the way to zero for our very lowest end devices. Uh, in the bottom, um, that's setting up the uh, scalability settings for uh, uh, LOD transitions for our characters and for our environment. We have uh, the Android device profile selector, uh, which chooses uh, which profile and therefore which scalability settings to use uh, based on the device. And because there are a large number of Android devices, we can't possibly set an individual profile for each. So we have some rules where we can match based on specific device models for the ones, especially for the Samsung devices where we've heavily optimized each of the devices, um, but also based on GPU model or the version of Android it's running, if we have to work around some driver bugs on some uh, older devices, uh, the version string in the driver, et cetera. Um, and each of uh, the profiles uh, is set up in some config, uh, in a config file which defines um, the console variables to set, including the scalability groups. So on the right-hand side, we have uh, Galaxy S8 um, with a medium quality. The, the, you can see the foliage has been reduced um, and the resolution has been reduced. Um, the draw distances have been changed in terms of the LOD transitions. The bottom, the Note 9, is using our high quality, uh, highest quality settings. And so these are set up um, in the top is the rule we use to match the Note 9, and here we're just matching the model of the Note 9. There are some sanity checks for the version of Android it's running, um, but provided it passes those checks, um, we enable the uh, Android Galaxy Note 9 Adreno Vulkan profile, which is uh, defined in the bottom. And from left to right, we're giving most specific settings. So the, the settings just for uh, the Note 9 to more general um, settings for high-end devices and then for all Android devices. So it lets us easily set up a bunch of scalability options that are going to work across a large uh, range of devices. So 
our goal uh, for Fortnite was uh, 30 frames per second at the highest visual quality possible, but we can't just set that as the goal and then um, max out everything until we hit 30, because if we set the device uh, using 100% of CPU or 100% of GPU, we'll generate a lot of heat, which will cause the device maybe to downclock. As well, it's not a very comfortable gameplay experience, and battery usage is not going to be ideal. So instead, we've targeted 60 frames where possible um, for the environment, uh, excluding any gameplay. So just running around the environment with just the player, um, you know, pretty much all the time, we want to uh, hit 60 frames, and then we've left the other 16 milliseconds as kind of buffer to handle um, player-built environments that Fortnite players will be, will be building or, um, you know, intensive firefights. So early on, uh, we created this thing called Profile Go, which was just a script to jump around to the different points of interest in the Fortnite level, run some console commands, dump out some CSVs, and we'd gather some stats. And this allowed us to track uh, the rendering performance at these locations over time as we made um, content changes and, uh, and optimizations. So every day, we would compare the deltas to what the previous versions were. Um, <laughs> But as we went on, um, we found uh, optimizing for gameplay situations was more, became more and more important. Um, and so since about April this year, we've had a, a replay system on consoles and PC, and PC where you can play a game and you can record it and then uh, mix it up and put it on YouTube. And we probably could record those on mobile, but we don't currently and we don't need to because of the beauty of crossplay. We're completely network compatible with PC and consoles, so we can take a PlayStation 4 replay and play it back on a mobile device using mobile settings and um, see that um, and see that performance, measure that performance um, to identify optimization targets or um, or uh, you know the cause of hitches, etc. Um, so this is great; it's repeatable. We can run the same replay over and over again, and we can do A/B testing. And so this is the results from, um, from some of our, of our actual gameplay. Um, the blue line is the 60 frame per second mark, so pretty much we're hitting constant 60. And the colorful lines below are representing the different threads that we have, most important one being the, the green one, which is our RHI thread, which is um, the, uh, dr the draw calls that are being issued to OpenGL or Vulkan. And in this case, we could see during an intensive firefight, about two thirds of the way through the game, we're finding um, we're pretty high um, on the render threads, so we, uh, on the RHI threads. So we wanted to see what the cause was. We bumped down the quality um, level down to medium from high, and we can see okay, we need to do a bit more optimization on the content in this case because compared to the highest quality settings, if we just knock those down, everything is, is a lot flatter. So I mentioned the RHI thread. Uh, threading was very important for achieving a good performance on uh, Fortnite Battle Royale. Um, on Android, we can assume we've always got at least four cores, too big and too little. Um, of course, on Exynos devices, we, we might have eight cores. Um, but uh, because we have these cores available, um, the biggest bottleneck we're having uh, is issuing draw calls, so enabling uh, what we call the RHI thread, which is a thread that just sits there and interacts with either the OpenGL driver or the Vulkan driver, sending commands um, has freed up a lot of, um, or has allowed us to get the maximum possible performance. Uh, so on the right-hand side, the very top uh, blue is the game thread, and this is where we are running um, uh, the simulation, so updating positions of objects in the environment, testing collision, um, handling player uh, input, handling the network code. And uh, that only takes a small amount of the frame. A lot of the time, it's just sitting there waiting. Um, the next is the render thread, which is now that we've updated the environment, we need to decide what to render. So we have to see what's visible. We have to um, uh, update positions of particles and rendering only effects. And then um, we need to issue the draw calls. Because we've got the RHI thread, which is the third block there, we can then um, offload all of that, so all of those RHI, uh, uh, the, all of those render uh, commands are being sent from that extra thread. 
In a more complicated case, um, uh, the game thread is about one frame ahead of the, of the final RHI thread that's doing the, the rendering. So on the top left, spending a little bit of time updating the world, and then the middle uh, part, we are, um, we've got the position of all the objects. Now we need to work out what's visible and, rend and uh, run the Unreal Engine rendering code. And then finally, that issues uh, the draw calls, which are in the bottom right corner uh, on the RHI thread. The, uh, the next uh, topic I want to talk about is memory. And um, memory on Android uh, is always a major challenge, and especially for Fortnite, because, um, as I said, we need to have the, the full console and PC experience worth of content uh, loaded. Um, one of the big challenges about Android is the out-of-memory behavior is not that straightforward. Um, even though we're not swapping like you would on a PC, Pages uh, that are backed by files, such as executable code, uh, can still be swapped out, and then the operating system will, will uh, load those pages back again. So if we're actually very close to running out of memory, we can suddenly hit a performance cliff where the operating system is continuously um, thrashing, loading executable pages at, uh, in, and then uh, removing them again as they're not needed. Um, and we see this in practice. Um, not so much on Samsung devices, but we have seen that on a, a bunch of popular devices in the wild. So, um, okay, we just need to stay with the memory budget if we don't want to run out of memory, but setting a memory budget is also not straightforward. Um, as an example, on a, a Galaxy S8, we uh, made a program that just tried to allocate as much memory, fill that memory, and then wait until we're terminated by the operating system. And on a four gig device, we could allocate about three gigs. So that was, you know, that seems pretty reasonable. But uh, on a Pixel 2, we could only allocate about 1.8 of its 3.6 gigs of total memory before we were killed by the operating system. Um, measuring memory is also quite difficult. The question everybody wants to know is, you know, how much memory am I using and is it more than yesterday? We can use our internal tools, so we track Obviously, we track all the allocations we make and the kind of assets we have loaded and all these kind of high-level things using, um, using the internal tools to Unreal Engine. We also have some lower-level tools, such as our low-level memory tracker that kind of tracks every allocation the game makes. Then we have you know, some Android APIs we can call, and we have an external um, uh, dumpsys meminfo command we can run using ADB to give us uh, some memory information. But what we're not seeing out of all of these is the memory used by the GPU driver. Um, we can make estimations for these, but frame buffers, textures, shaders, the shader compiler itself, all of these things are resident um, or may be resident and being using, uh, be using amounts of memory that we can't easily track. There's also, you know, Android's an open platform, so people can be running, um, you know, their favorite music streaming app in the background, or they could be using a social network app in the background that um, is using a portion of our memory. Um, so if you look at uh, the ADB shell dump sys meminfo, which is kind of the, the best overall tool we have to see the state of memory, um, unfortunately it gives us PSS, which is a proportional, so it's telling us for our particular process what proportion of the pages um, we're using for shared pages. So if there are uh, uh, executable code we are using that's also being used by another background application, the memory reported to us from Dumpsys Meminfo will be half because how those pages are shared, we're getting the proportional answer. So it's not such a good measure of how much memory am I using when we want to uh, look for repeatable testing. So we have to be quite careful when our QA compares memory to previous, uh, to previous builds that we're really testing the same situations. Also, with Dumpsys Meminfo, not everything is nicely categorized. A lot of it does end up in the unknown category. So, um, a step back from memory for a second, we'll come back to it, but one of the biggest um, memory uh, um, uh, challenges we had was due to the amount of shaders that our artists create. And in Unreal Engine 4, if you want to create a shader, um, it's just using an artist-driven tool, connecting um, you know, visual boxes together to make beautiful shaders. And our artists like to do this a lot. Um, 
we have over uh, 2,000 individual combinations of, um, of shader programs with pixel and vertex shaders, and um, these are all generating unique GLSL code behind the scenes. So we need this uh, shader, we need these shaders ready to, to render, right? Um, but unfortunately, OpenGL doesn't have a, a standard pre-compiled shader format. Each device has to compile its shaders from source code, and uh, the shader compiler is not particularly fast at runtime. Um, on Vulkan, we need to have a pipeline save. Um, it's a similar problem. And we want to avoid hitches, so we uh, use what we call our PSO cache system, which is during development and playtesting, we're recording the shaders we use to render the game and then storing that list of, of PSOs um, uh, that we rendered with and at runtime, um, at startup, we would compile those shaders. That's all well and good, but even compiling, because we have so many shaders, um, uh, that, that, even that takes about two minutes, and which is too long. So our solution is to compile once and save the binaries out. Um, either for OpenGL, we use this uh, extension. Um, that's what's happening when you see the optimizing content screen in Fortnite. Um, subsequent launches, we can quickly load uh, those back again in about 10 seconds. So it's done in parallel to the rest of the loading. For Vulkan, we save the, the pipeline cache. Um, in a similar way at the same time. But shaders are managed by the driver, uh, and we can't exactly measure how much memory they're taking up. And so we can look at the binaries on disk, and for those 2,000 shaders, the total shader size was about 40 megabytes. It's not great, but it's OK. But we then measured that that was uh, turning into about 250 meg of allocations in the driver. And it's understandable, because the driver has to manage different permutations for different state. Um, and uh, when we're using actual uniform buffers, that was uh, increasing the permutations the, um, the driver was needing to create and store up to about 400 meg. Um, and so our solution to this was to use uh, what we call the LOU cache. This is a, a cache we have for shaders where we uh, create shaders just in time from the binary representations and then destroy them when they're no longer needed. And that 40 meg of data compresses quite well, just down to 10 meg, and we um, can stream or we can create and destroy those shaders just in time as they're needed. And overall, that saved us about 200 megabytes on some devices. Um, so this is from an S8. Um, it's just under 200 meg was saved in this case. The LOU cache is pretty good. It's, it's really necessary. Um, to save memory and uh, to keep the shaders in check uh, for Adreno and Mali devices. But we do see some extra hitching uh, from the shader reconstruction. Um, this is without the LRU cache. If I enable the LRU cache, uh, there's a little bit of extra uh, time, especially on the RHI thread. Um, but uh, it's, um, it's necessary, and we've been able to, to focus, um, especially Given the extra latency we have between the rendering thread and the RHI thread, we've been able to, um, to reduce that hitching as much as possible. So um, we've done a lot of work to optimize, and with Samsung's help uh, as well, to optimize UE4 for Fortnite. And uh, all of these improvements have been made available to all of our licensees. So there's a bunch of scalability improvements for the way we can scale um, assets um, on a per-platform basis, which we didn't used to have. Um, there's a bunch of very general uh, memory and performance improvements for, for many of the systems in Unreal Engine. Um, and more recently, we have the latest Vulkan code um, uh, that is used in Fortnite is now shared with our licensees, so everybody gets the benefits of uh, Samsung Game Dev's efforts in that area as well. So, as I mentioned, um, you know, Vulkan support has been key to getting really good performance on the uh, S9 and Note 9. Um, we're continuing to make this available to lower-end devices as we um, work through optimizations that are most applicable to those devices. Um, uh, but we are 100% feature compatible with exactly everything we're doing on ES3.1, um, and the results are you know, identical between them. Um, 
And uh, Sungmin's now going to go into detail some of the optimizations we've made for Fortnite Vulcan and uh, explain those. So I'll hand it over to him. Thank you, Jack, for introducing me. And I'm Sangmin from Samsung Game Dev team. And Samsung Game Dev is supporting the many bunch of guys who are working for game studios and game engine developers for optimizing the mobile games. So in this time, we cooperate with Epic Games for the Fortnite, the, world, the popular game in the world. And we are more focused on the optimizing the Vulkan API. So I want to tell you about the advantage of the Vulkan briefly. Uh, actually, the Vulkan is the next generation graphics API. So it is lightweight and it is explicit comparing than GL. So it has more possibility to optimize for the high fidelity games. And as it is lightweight, uh, it can reduce the CPU load. So if there's uh, many draw calls, we can, removing the, uh, we can remove the bottlenecks on the CPU side, and we can use that budget of power to improve GPU jobs. So here's the real example. Uh, this game is a lineage tool evolution, and you can see that the, on GL version, the average FPS around the 28, but Vulkan shows over 43, so almost 50% uh, performance is improved. So that's why we more focused on the Vulkan and want to spread out to other mobile games. So what about the uh, Fortnite? Uh, have you ever played the Fortnite before? So uh, actually, as you know, the Fortnite has a tremendous object to draw, like buildings, foliage trees, or items, and so on. So like in this video, uh, the, you can see that draw core is around the about 100, uh, 1,500, and sometimes it go over two or 3,000. So it is a really huge number on mobile environment. So handling this whole object is really burden on the CPU side, which block the GPU power. So the previous advantage of the Vulkan can improve the performance, but unfortunately, just adapting the Vulkan directly is not the solution in, because there's some still bottlenecks or optimization points on impl uh, existing implementation of uh, Vulkan rendering hierarchy interface of on your engine. So here's uh, our the Fortnite behind story, what Samsung Game Dev and Epic Games uh, cooperated and have implemented, optimized the performance and memory side as well. In performance side, we have uh, three impact items, optimizing render paths, removing staging buffer, and optimizing the query management. The Samsung Game Dev have emphasized the importance of render passes and render, uh, pipeline barrier. So uh, the changing render paths really frequently uh, gives a huge impact on the performance and especially uh, begin the render pass with road operation and end with uh, store operation is really costly on memory bandwidth perspective. So the early implementation phase of the Fortnite has many render pass transition like in the first column of the pictures for drawing the, some shadows and some unneeded render pass just interrupted. So we optimize them like merging and pending the render pass at to, not to be interrupted and the second column of the picture shows the result, and we capture that with the Mali graphics debugger. And then you can see the fragment job is reduced and more detailed in, the, in this table. The time for rendering one frame is reduced about uh, 30 milliseconds, and the fragment job is reduced about 90%. So this is why we always saying the importance of the render passes. And the second one is about the removing staging buffer. And if you copy the CPU data to GPU with the Vulkan, you need allocating the staging buffer and copy the data to there, and then uh, copy that staging data to GPU again. So a little bit complicated process. But actually, in mobile environment, has the unified memory. So this means you can use a common buffer for, for CPU and GPU. So you can allocating the common buffer with the host visible and coherent flags. 
So we suggest this to Unreal Engine, and we, now we save the time for allocating or releasing the staging buffer and the double, double copy things. So we check this on the loading time of the Fortnite, and with the staging buffer, it takes about 160 milliseconds for uh, average, but after removing the staging buffer, it reduced under the 0 0.02 milliseconds. So we, it's a really huge difference, and we reduced the loading time also, and the FPS stability on the run, running while running the game is really improved. And the last one is about the query management. Fortnite using the occlusion query for the calling, so it needs the manager for the queries. So previous version of the Orlean engine using the global query pool, and in there a lot of the queries, and some of the queries already occupied by other frames. And if the engine needs some like certain queries uh, in some of the frame, the Vulkan allocate the, uh, the, the queries index. And then after that frame, if the engine needs the results, Vulkan needs to call the VK get query results 13 times. After this, this process, the engine needs to reset them to reusing the queries. So in that time, also, Vulkan need to set, uh, call VK reset query pool 13 time also. So these duplicated uh, function calls makes a huge bottleneck on CPU side. So, but good thing is that those two API can handle multiple queries in one one call. So we decide to change the managing logic like uh, dedicate uh, allocating dedicated query pool per each frame, not using the global one. So now we can handle the whole queries for that frame with just one API call. So for example, if the engine needs some n number of queries in that frame, the Vulkan allocate in the query pool and allocate in the queries as well. And then if the engine needs the results, now we can get the whole the result of the queries with this one call of the VK get query result call. And after that, also we can reset these whole queries for reusing with just one function calls. So someone can have some doubts how this removing duplicated call and changing the managed logic improved the performance. So I brought the real example. After this fix, we got two more FPS and the FPS stability is increased by 15%. And the below uh, graph shows the result more simply. You can see the bright light, uh, bright blue line is more stable on the 30 FPS, and uh, there's a uh, many spikes which is hitching or lag on the game is reduced. So this definitely gives a great experience to game users. And the improving the performance is one of the most important thing in the game, but we should not forget the other side like memory. Imagine that uh, you are going to be a winner in the game, but your app just crashed or shut down by overflowed memory. It's, it is a disaster, right? So we also take care about the memory side also. So, and we usually trace the memory uh, with the two ways. The first one is using the Vulkan layer, which hooked the Vulkan API, so we can trace whole Vulkan objects when they created or destroyed. And the second one is collecting the Android dump system memory logs. After the collecting these logs, we can draw this kind of graph. And we capture this while three looping replay. But we figure out that even we uh, play the same content in three time, the memory is keep increasing. And this definitely lead the memory, memory leak situation. So we should find the uh, main problem and needed to fix them. So the main root cause was on the some miss point on the cache logics. Actually, Onion Engine used many hash map for the caching. So for example, if the engine needs to generate a pipeline, it prepare a lot of the details for them and calculate the hash value using some of them. 
and then it look up the hash map if the pipeline is already created or not. But the real problem was that while the calculating the hash, uh, it used the pointer value. That means even the totally pipe, same pipeline, the pointer value can be changed, and then time, we should make another new pipeline. So it is the starting point of the memory leak. So we find out that, and after that, we change those pointer value to real variable and removing some many dependencies on the hash map. So before this fix, the cache hit rate was around 80% on second run or third run, but we improved that over 90%. And more remarkable change was on the broken objects. Like, for example, the script set layout and pipeline layout was increased over 17,000 or 9,000, but it reduced to 500 or 270, respectively, so it's almost 97% reduced. It's a huge difference. And more good thing is that we checked that there's no more memory leaks, and we saved about 500 megabytes. So still, there's other many changes, like uh, optimizing the pipeline barrier or removing the reduced uh, duplicated objects. But unfortunately, we cannot handle this whole contents on this session. So if you have some interest of our optimization points, please come to our code lab behind our this session room, and you can make these our optimization points to real things on your own. Anyway, uh, here's the real comparison with the GL versus the Vulkan version, and this kind of uh, complicated battle scene, Vulkan shows the average FPS as 47, and it is increased about 8 FPS comparing the GL version, and it's almost 20% improved. And also, we improved the FPS stability with the Vulkan, so we can provide more, uh, more grateful environment to game users. So uh, we got a lot of improvement, both uh, performance side and memory side, but still there's some remaining optimization points, like uh, optimizing the descriptor set logics or adding some multi subpass features. So we are planning to keep our connection more strongly with the Epic Games and game developers and, to, and trying to make other great new optimization points and adding some additional features to engine side, then we can provide a grateful uh, environment and experience to game users and game developers as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sangmin. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there are any questions, um, you know, feel free to ask now, or you can also come and find us outside as well, if you're too shy to ask now. Oh. <laughs> yes. <Hi>. It's <laughs> uh, Is this working? Yeah, all right. Yeah. In the, uh, the pipeline cache uh, hash, you, you mentioned about the pointers. Uh, it seemed like you said that you also changed which values were hashed. Did you do that? Uh, so, I was, what I was thinking of uh, when I heard that was like, oh, some of the states in the pipeline cache actually doesn't matter so much versus. So we changed the the while the calculating hash value, some value just reference the point the structure of yeah. the pointer. So we changed this those whole variable to that real structure value. But so, yeah. we, we hash the entire structure, right? We, yeah. we it is all, the, it so, is all the values. So we don't attempt to work out what parts yeah. of uh -huh. the, the hash are not, uh, okay. not uh -huh. so important. We, do not, we don't, do not do that in right. It's a good idea, though. Anyone else? Any question? <laughs> Question from Samsung Game Dev. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Thank you so, for, yeah. You have to go to the next slide, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, please rate the sessions and win prizes. <laughs> yeah. The, Thank you very I, much. I heard the higher you rate the session, the more likely you are to win prizes.